Does magic come from the gods, Kryn, within yourself, or all of the above? Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga episode. My name is Adam, and today we're going to talk about the magic of Kryn. I'd like to take a moment and thank the members of this channel, and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance gaming materials using my affiliate link. I'm referencing the appendix from Dragons of a Vanished Moon for this information. If you have any thoughts on how magic works in Dragonlance, leave them in the comments below. As presented in the original Advanced Dungeons & Dragons modules, magic was gifted by the gods to mortals. Divine magic was unavailable, as men had turned their backs on the gods since the Cataclysm. With the end of DL1 Dragons of Despair, divine magic returned, with Goldmoon and the Discs of Mishakal being delivered to Elistan, who had become the first priest of Paladine Alt Cataclysm. Henceforth, once again, the true priests of the gods were granted magic through their holy symbols. Arcane magic was granted to those willing to devote their lives to the art, but it was structured and controlled by the orders of high sorcery. This was a straightforward presentation of how and why magic existed on Kryn. This changed slightly as the campaign world grew in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd edition, as the history of Kryn was being further detailed, the box set Dwarven Kingdoms of Kryn presented ideas of elemental magic that were inherent to the planet that the smiths could tap into and use. This magic would ultimately disappear with the gods' continued influence and control, and by the time the Grey Gem was lost, elemental magic was completely gone. Though the Scions, as a result of the Grey Gem, were able to still practice elemental magic. Whether this was a magical gift from chaos or their ability to continue tapping into the existing elemental magic lost to the smiths is still yet unclear. Many of these scions were slaughtered by their jealous kin, and if any still exist, it's only in hiding. Then came the Summer of Chaos and the true absence of the gods. In this fifth age and the saga system, Kryn was stripped of all divine and arcane magic. Palin Majir would ask Fizban the Fabulous if any magic remained in the world just before his departure, and Fizban replied, Not as you know it. There may be other magic. It is up to you to find it. What Palin would come to discover is that when the gods crafted Kryn, they imbued it with magical energies. This divine power is what grants all magical creatures their abilities, and as it was dormant in the planet itself, mortals could learn to tap into it in the forms of mysticism and sorcery. Now, whether this new magic was in fact just the elemental magic of old, or if it was something separate, was never clarified in the time, but it is certain that there were two distinct areas from which the denizens of Kryn drew magic from, the gods or the planet. Then came the War of Souls, and it all changed again. Or did it? A new understanding of the Fifth Age in Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition was made, as Tekises had stolen the world. The gods didn't depart it, and it was her who granted magic to all in the form of mysticism and sorcery. While the spirits of all who died remained, bringing Tekises magical power, making her even stronger. Whether this was just Tekises' way of manipulating the people of Kryn into believing in her, or if it was in fact the truth, was later clarified by Tracy Hickman and Matthew L. Martin in the appendix of Dragons of a Vanished Moon. In the section Glory of the Gods, the Four Powers, they outlined that it's due to mortals' actions and death that lend power to the gods, and that the gods then return power to their living followers. <laughs> Confused yet? Here, hold my drink. The balance so important to Kryn, and by extension those who inhabit it, is outlined in the Tobril. The gods benefit from this as much as the mortals, as they benefit each other by playing their roles set out for each other by the High God. There are again two kinds of power that exist on Kryn, the power that is granted by the gods in the form of Divine and Arcane, 
and the power that is inherent in the creation of the planet in the forms of mysticism and sorcery. Not to get too in the weeds, but even that can be seen as a gift from gods, as they're the ones that created the world. It is the cycles of faith and creation that connect the gods and mortals, affording a sort of symbiotic power flux to exist between them. There are inherent flaws to this idea, such as, if the gods don't have the followers, do they still have the power? Or by extension, enough power to give prospective followers? But then we're getting a little too close to Neil Gaiman's American Gods territory. Even the wild magic is a result of the mortals' relationship to Kryn, so you could say mortals are the magical element to, well, magic. <laughs> the ambient elemental or creative energy within Kryn is disrupted by chaos in the form of the Grey Gem and evil. As attempts to unbalance the planet and disrupt the natural order have dramatic effects on the give and take of magic itself. The same can be reiterated in the harmony between the gods and mortals, as not all gods are equal, neither are all mortals, so the great cosmic struggle continues, both above and below. This is perfectly personified in the Fifth Age, when Tachesis, bereft of worshippers and too weak to present herself, draws power from the souls trapped, unable to continue to the higher plane after death. But even this was not enough for the Dark Queen, as she sent the souls out to drain casters and items of their magic. The balance is lost, and magic suffers. Rather than being an open circuit of souls entering the world, worshipping the gods, and the gods feeding the energy back to the mortals until their death, where they move on to another plane, Rin becomes a closed circuit, empowering and unbalancing the world even more. With Tachesis drawing power from the trapped souls and her followers, and the other gods brept of both, she became increasingly more powerful by comparison. But again, the high god wrote in the Tobril the cycles of faith and creation, so when an imbalance is created, all of the gods and mortals ultimately suffer. It is a rather simplistic and, if we're honest, Abrahamic-inspired outline that ties together the original inclusion of an existing game system with which birthed the campaign world and the hard left turn it took when it jumped game systems in the Fifth Age, from Advanced Dungeons & Dragons to Saga System and back again. In the post-War of Souls Age of Mortals, the gods are increasingly reliant on mortals for their influence in the heavens and on Kryn, as the mortals have a choice where they draw magic from. This presents an even more godly-influenced game world than Kryn was to begin with. The Greek and Roman pantheons have nothing on Kryn here, folks. Dragonlance certainly wears its stretch marks of growth on its sleeve, but as a fan of the systems, I like to believe it shows them with pride. Though Dragonlance may have taken wrong turns <laughs> more than once, it seems to always correct itself in one way or another because we fans refuse to give up on it. In this way, we're simply repeating the cycle outlined in the Tobril in our world by giving an incredible amount of power to the campaign world even when it's out of fashion, forcing the powers that be to cycle back and give us even more. <laughs> I, for one, could do without the Abrahamic dogma of the cycles of faith and creation, but if I'm being honest, they do end up adding even more flair to this already exciting and engaging world. So if I had to take a bit of salt with the sweet, bring it on. <laughs> but that is all I have to say about the magic of Kryn. Is this presentation of magic new for you? Is it much different from how you perceived it before? And finally, are you interested in how magic works in the lore at all? Leave a comment below. I'm able to create these weekly videos because of your attention and support. If you're not already a member of this YouTube channel, I'd like to invite you to consider becoming one. If you'd like to pick up any edition of Dragonlance Gaming materials, feel free to use my affiliate link in the description. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, and I hope you'll join me in the celebration. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, remember... The dark crimes that stain my soul, brother, you cannot begin 
to imagine.